We're really glad you're all with us today. This is wonderful to be with you, and I'm very thankful for each of you. Um, it's great to be with you on the second Sunday of the season of Eastertide. Kicked off last week for uh, with our Easter Sunday service over in the amphitheater. Um, Easter Sunday is very commonly used for one primary purpose. If you've been in church for any length of time, this will not be unfamiliar to you. It will be something you will have heard of before. It's a fairly common denominator in churches across the U.S., and when I straw polled a few friends after last Sunday, this was true for a lot of their churches. For many um, staff and pastors in churches uh, around the world, Easter Sunday, uh, they feel the burden of proof. It feels like there is an important opportunity on Easter Sunday to explain the proof for the resurrection, to prove its validity, its historical moment, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus, in fact, existed, was exactly who he said he was, died, and was resurrected and ascended 40 40 days later. A couple of decades ago, a man named Josh McDowell released a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, in which he argues that there is not only enough evidence to barely prove that Jesus lived and resurrected from the dead, but there is overwhelming evidence that Jesus lived and was resurrected from the dead. He doesn't just say that there is plenty of evidence to the contrary, or there's not enough evidence to the contrary, rather, but that there is tons of evidence to support this claim. Um, he takes an interesting approach as sort of a skeptic leading into uh, the, write, the authorship of this book. He takes a similar approach to a man named Lee Strobel, who you may have heard of as well. Uh, Lee Strobel wrote the Case for series. It's like 16 books, Case for Faith, Case for Christ, Case for everything, anything, case for lunch, case for everything you can imagine. Um, He wrote them all, and both of them take an investigative and skeptical approach to proving many of the claims of Jesus and Christianity itself. And it's extremely compelling because they, in many ways, set out to disprove these things, in many ways set out to find if there's any holes to be poked in this. And McDowell concludes this about the resurrection specifically. The resurrection of Jesus is the most documented, well-attested event in ancient history, which is a bold statement. I mean, that's a mic drop, right? If that's the case, wow, that's incredible. There's a lot of things documented from ancient history. There's a lot of things attested to in ancient history. And even if all of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus was mid, and even if all of the evidence for... Jesus' resurrection was like kind of attested to, it would still be pretty remarkable. And yet, this man says that there is overwhelming evidence. Now, if you've been around for a while, you know that I was a super apologetics nerd in high school and in my teen years in general, and I really liked this stuff. And of course, I had all these guys' books on my shelf, and I referenced them a lot. And I found some of these claims to be a little bit too um, easy to come by. I don't know that McDowell backs that claim up extremely well in his book upon a second review of it in my later on years. But nonetheless, regardless of whether or not I think that claim can be backed up, that it is the most well-attested and well-evidenced event in ancient history, I do believe in a bodily resurrection from the dead of Jesus. I believe that Jesus... His, I believe that Jesus' heart rate flatlined. I believe that three days later, he rose from the dead. And I believe that 40 days after that, he ascended to be with his father. I believe that. And my belief of that is exactly that. It is a belief. You see, where there isn't perfect, irrefutable evidence, for instance, I'm not an eyewitness to the crucifixion or the resurrection. That would be irrefutable evidence for me. But where I don't have that, I have faith, and I have belief. And for some people, leaning on belief or faith to fill in the gaps feels like um, it discredits the thing that we say that we believe. But in reality, when we have humility and we have a realism about our faith, And we can say, yeah, it's faith that gets me the rest of the way. 
It's belief that helps me fill in the gaps where I don't have irrefutable personal evidence for something. That actually adds to our credibility because we're willing to look at something realistically. We're willing to say, yes, I have faith. I have belief in this thing. Now, many of you aren't really sure what you think about the resurrection of Jesus. Some of you are pretty sure that Jesus uh, was killed and that his body was stolen, and that's why the tomb is empty. Some of you think that Jesus was resuscitated slightly after the crucifixion, and he wasn't actually ever completely dead. and didn't stay dead if he was dead. Um, some of you are just trying to figure out some of the basics of faith, trying to figure out, like, what are some of the basics of what Jesus was teaching? Sermon on the Mount, uh, Fruit of the Spirit, uh, Beatitudes. You're trying to figure that stuff out, and you're like, resurrection from the dead will come when it comes. I'm trying to figure out some of the basics of this, and that's okay, too. All of you come, all of us come from very different and a variety of backgrounds, and that is one of the beautiful things about our church that I'm so grateful for. Throughout this series that we're starting last Sunday and continuing on today about the implications of the resurrection, what I want you to consider is not whether or not you believe the resurrection to have happened, because sometimes we get distracted by the premise. What I want you to think about and consider is what does the resurrection mean, whether literal or metaphorical? Because for some of you, it's literal, and for some of you, it's metaphorical. And I think that it can have the same implications for us, regardless of what you think about it. Now, my hope is that you would come to a belief, a faith, in the literal resurrection of Jesus. I think that would be really cool. If somewhere on your journey, you came to that point. And I certainly want to help pave the way for that. But I also don't want you to get distracted by the premise and miss the punchline. Because the punchline is where all the good stuff is. That's what I want you to get out of this series. That's what I want you to consider. Um, this, the story that Emily read just a minute ago is the same story that uh, Aaron read last Sunday at our Easter service. I wanted us to hear it twice because it's a beautiful, mind-blowing, incredible, sort of heart-stretching story that makes us wonder about a lot of things, but it uses language. Matthew uses language that I think we can relate to. Particularly, there's a phrase that I want to draw your attention to in that text. It says that the women were afraid yet filled with joy. Afraid yet filled with joy. Now, the word for afraid here, the Greek word used for afraid, is a word that means more than just being scared or being afraid for your life or for your safety. It actually has within it this idea of reverence or awe or wonder. It's kind of embedded in there. When I think about this kind of fear, this kind of reverence, I oftentimes think of one of my favorite books, a book called Call It Courage. It's a book by Armstrong Sperry, um, and it's been one of my favorite books for a very long time. In fact, last May, when I was riding my bike down the West Coast, I had finished a book that I had with me. I had one book with me. I had finished it, and I found a free library, little one of those little neighborhood libraries on my way down, and I pulled my bike over, and I opened it up to just exchange a book. I was like, I'll read whatever's here. And there was a copy of Call It Courage, which was one of my favorite books for a very long time now. And so I swapped it out, and I read it again. And I read it a couple of times on that trip because it's very short. Most of you could read it in an afternoon if you really wanted to, okay? So I highly recommend the book. But one of the things that the book does beautifully is it creates in the reader a sense of awe and a sense of wonder and a sense of kind of like overwhelmed um, just at the vast expanse and power of the sea. You see, the, the character, I won't tell you the whole thing, but the main character of the book um, kind of goes through this process of being terrified by a thing that eventually he has to conquer. And it's a fantastic book with a, a, a harrowing story. And in it, you understand what exactly fear can do what fear can produce. Fear holds within it a reverence that produces courage. That's the kind of fear that Mary and the other women had at the tomb that morning in the garden. A reverence that produces courage. When Mary experienced this fear, when the women experienced this fear, they didn't cower and run away. They didn't cower um, because they were afraid for their life. They worshipped in a way. And then they went to tell other people because when you experience something powerful like that, you go and tell other people about it. 
It's one of the reasons why I love the mountains so much. I feel an awe and a wonder when I'm among them. Mountains are brutal, and they can be deadly, and I feel overwhelmed by their power. The weather, the landscape, the exposure, everything overwhelms me. My guess is you can think of something in your life as well. I remember feeling something really similar. This was very strange when, uh, when Mia moved into our home, holding her when she was two or three days old, and thinking, I am overwhelmed with awe, and I am terrified by this little thing, so fragile, who needs me to survive. This is mind-blowing. This is the kind of fear that Mary experienced. Many of you have experienced something similar. Maybe you've experienced that kind of fear when you consider the complexity of God, when you consider the wonder of who God is. But you don't cower away. You keep coming back on a Sunday to explore more. Maybe you'll crack your Bible and read a little bit more because you want to know more about it. Maybe you'll sit with somebody in prayer to engage God because that's how you want to proceed with courage, even though you also feel fear. The other thing that it says they experienced was joy. And usually when we think about joy, we think of the word elation, or we think of just an overwhelming happiness that sustains itself for a long period of time. Elation is exhilarating, and it usually involves a rush of adrenaline and other chemicals that come from our adrenal glands that make us feel wonderful. But the idea, when we look closer to the word used here for joy that comes along with it, is more of a sustained contentment, more of a satisfaction than an elation. If adrenaline is going to be associated with the elation of joy, I would associate serotonin with this particular word, something that helps stabilize, something that helps people feel content and satisfied. Now, what I just just did and what you just witnessed was somebody digging so deeply into the words Two words that come from a particular text that we are on the cusp, we're on the precipice of missing the forest for the trees. So this is the point where when you're doing Bible study or something like that, that you've got to be able to reel it back in and go, okay, what is happening in the big picture here? That sort of word study is fun. That sort of word study is an easy thing to geek out on if you want to really dig in. But we can easily miss the point if we're not careful. So let's zoom out again before we get too bogged down in what these words mean, and let's think about the whole story. This phrase, this idea of being afraid and yet filled with joy, carries with it, holds within it, the very complexities that you and I experience when we think about God, when we think about the resurrection. Oftentimes in our communion liturgy and other liturgical parts of our service or throughout the year, We use the words celebrate with courage. We celebrate with courage all that God has done for us today, and we hold on to hope for all that God will do for us tomorrow. Celebration with courage requires acknowledging all the pain and all the sorrow and all the hardship and all the lament in the life that we live and in the world around us. Perhaps on Sunday last week or Maybe just throughout this week, you've thought about how strange it was to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus while there was so much death and destruction in the Middle East. Perhaps there's some sort of pain in your own life, your own body, your own family that you're experiencing, and it feels like a juxtaposition. That's exactly what these women felt when they saw the tomb empty, afraid yet filled with joy. Fear, remember, produces in us a courage, a courage to acknowledge the pain and the sorrow and the difficulty around us. You see, we do both at the same time in the season of Eastertide. It's not a dishonest celebration. You Maybe you've been a part of those before where you're celebrating as though everything is fine. Everything's come together. It's okay. Let's just ignore all the difficulties in life. That's not the kind of celebration that is available to us in Eastertide, and it's certainly not what I want for you. I want an honest celebration from you, one that requires courage. The resurrection means that the beauty of new life is available to behold, not because the ugliness of death and despair are gone, but precisely because they are still very present, and we celebrate anyways. We celebrate anyways. 
because the resurrection means that eventually, maybe soon, maybe later, all of the sorrow will be wiped away. All of the unfinished business of lament will be wrapped up. It will be completed. That's what resurrection means, that it will be finished. And that's what you and I get to experience when we consider resurrection in context, when we consider celebration in context. So what will you celebrate in Eastertide? And as you do so, what will it cost you? What will it require of you? How will you juxtapose your celebration with the pain and the sorrow that remains present, even if we wish it didn't? Afraid yet filled with joy. This is the description of this entire season that we get to celebrate together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for what it has said to us. Thank you for the work of Christ, both on the cross and out of the grave. Thank you for what it means for us, the implications. Even if it's not always clear, may we ponder what they mean. May we not get too bogged down in the complexities of resurrection and the implications for us in the day-to-day, but rather just stand in awe and wonder, even if it requires courage from us. Thank you, Lord, for all the things you've given us. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.